the question was regarding the current issues that are going on with creation overall, the idea of this good dialogue and back and forth in a healthy way that's actually helpful for people to watch, maybe that are in all different areas of the camp on how do we understand creation in light of Scripture. Uh, the question was, are there examples that people could go read of the healthy back and forth of dialogue of trying to sort through hard issues that aren't obvious? Yes. Um, is this one? Should be, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'll try to bring it down to brass tacks. Uh, for, for, you know, if I go into a, a, a seminar on... I don't know, um, on um, uh, selling your house or, or, or buying a Medicare supplemental policy or whatever. You know, there's people in the room that know a lot more about it than I do. I feel like a dummy, but I want to listen to them and, and figure out what makes the most sense. So lay people on this issue, I'll, I would, if I were taking that same attitude, what's going to help me and make the most sense of it? I would recommend that you look at a couple of places where you can find people with different viewpoints presenting their viewpoint and then defending that viewpoint against criticisms of those who hold the other, okay? And then if you want to think for yourself what makes the most sense, I can't tell you what ought to make the most sense to you. I can only say, well, here's, here's some ideas well explained. What does make the most sense to you? And can you also understand why somebody else thinks that makes more sense? Say, so you have to have a little bit of uncertain, a little bit of open-mindedness in the sense that you can understand why somebody else thinks differently. And then, and perhaps also a sense of conviction about what you think makes the most sense. So if that's gonna be the attitude one would have toward this, then there's, there's a number of places one could go, but one, one very effective place to look at this might perhaps be a recent book from Zondervan on four views of um, creationism, evolution, intelligent design, I think is actually what it's called, mm -hmm. but there's four different authors who present four different perspectives on this. All four of the authors is a Christian. And, but then they argue with one another in the course of the book, as well as explaining their own position in their own words. So that might be helpful. For a Reformed audience such as this, a pri I'm assuming a primarily Reformed audience, there's an older book that might be very helpful that's more narrowly Reformed in the sense that all of the authors are Reformed in their theology. Um, that's a book called the Genesis Debate. If you have a telephone and take it out, I can help you find it easily. You want to look for the one where the word Genesis is spelled differently than normal. G, numeral three, N, numeral three, S, numeral one, S. In other words, one and three are embedded in the word Genesis replacing the letters E and I, okay? So it's about Genesis 1 to 3. And that's a, that's a book where there's three views presented, none of which is a view that accepts the validity of common ancestry of humans with other animals. All of them are viewpoints that are non-evolutionary in that sense. But they do argue about how to understand Genesis ruling out human evolution, how do you understand Genesis on some of these other issues? That might be helpful uh, for people here. Actually, those, um, if you haven't seen them before, in terms of a more general answer on those, uh, you know, where do you see healthy dialogue? The four views, there's sometimes five views. I believe some of the four views will as many as six, perhaps, so the counting is not always our best thing in theology. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the four views books are a really interesting place to do that because they'll choose topics. And the answers will generally be coming within, uh, depending on how narrowly you draw your circles, generally within evangelical or very close to evangelical authors on a variety of different topics, uh, including there's one on the soul that takes up this topic, which I believe is a five views book. 
uh, that takes up this topic of the brain and the neuroscience research and, and how that is going to play out. Uh, that, that book is already out there as well. So those books can be very helpful on a large number of different topics. To be able to see people trying to be thoughtful, um, uh, but disagree, thoughtfully disagree. All right, uh, I lost Sean again. Sean, I'm not getting them. They're not coming through. Our, like, the technology is letting us down. <laughs> Call it out. Yell it out. We've got questions. Yeah, this is science, but not tech. Actually, so it's a really interesting highlight. We can be good at science and bad at technology because they often get conflated, but science and technology are different things. <laughs> from a, a Christian evangelical perspective, and then the one specific for uh, Dr. Chesnus was on environmentalism itself, just the science of it? Ethical guidelines. Okay. And some ethical guidelines books. So if either one of you have resources that you know of that are good resources. Um, off the bat, um, Matthew Sleeth, he was an MD. He wrote uh, uh, Love God, Love the Planet, something like that. Um, also Redeeming Creation. Uh, Van Dyke et al. Um, or two recommendations uh, of uh, devout Christians that take a responsible look at environmental issues. Um, those are probably a decade old, both of those at least, um, but still I think solid foundations for folks that want to, uh, I think, start diving into it. Second question was about ethical guidelines. <laughs> Yes, that's okay. right. Resources on ethical guidelines. Oh, resources on ethical guidelines. Well, that, that's, that's a little bit tougher um, as far as getting into the, the ethics. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. I mean, I don't know if anyone's really put, like, you've got to go through this checklist of, of, uh, of ethical uh, actions to, uh, I mean, really, I think it just starts with awareness. It's the little things. I think it's just, just taking a look at what you consume, um, and how we use things. I think uh, we look at our waste streams. I think there's just, again, we just kind of look at those little things that we do um, that can add up. Um, but as far as, uh, um, I mean, th th those books that I, I, I listed earlier, though, do include um, chapters on, on certainly the ethics of environmentalism and things like that. So, but really, as far as just guidelines for ourselves, it's just kind of take a, just a look at what we do, what we consume, and. Uh, you know, and how we live. You know, we can't do everything all at once. And there's no expectations to. Larry, you indicated that this was something that was a topic that you considered to be important. I don't know if you have resources at so much as personal experience, but if you've got any that you'd like to add, I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, pastoral resources, perhaps, that, that are on this topic where you've read, even the ones you disagree with, because I think you're, there is this interesting, you, what, from what I was hearing this dichotomy between what you feel like is the message of the gospel and then these other extras that have gotten dragged in um, and taken for granted, maybe some things that help people to de de uh, deconstruct some of that. One of the, uh, the magazines, uh, news magazines I read is The Economist, which is a British magazine, and it is classical liberalism, which in the rest of the world means something different than liberalism in the United States, because liberalism in the United States is left-wing, conservatism is right-wing, and uh, classical liberalism would combine things like fiscal conservatism uh, with social liberalism. And so it messes up my categories as a uh, American, um, but it's pro-business, for example, uh, anti-regulation in general, and pro-environment, which are also combinations that are unusual on our side of the Atlantic. So I enjoy that magazine um, in, in, in part because it does, it does break through some of the categories that have gotten uh, isolated 
into uh, solid camps in the United States. So it helps me, it's, there's some desequilibration there in my mind, which is helpful for me to think through, through things. Uh, that would be a popular resource that would be possible. Okay, very good. Let me, actually I'm gonna switch sides and then you can just grab Lucina's microphone if one comes to you. Um, so I apologize for some of the technical issues today. Um, John, if you've got something. This would be for Dr. Uden. Uh, there was interest in your uh, referring to, you know, significant brain surgeries that would not impact a person's consciousness or concept of self. Um, can you uh, provide any alternatives to that? Like, can you think of any examples where that was dr uh, drastically different, where it did impact the person? Yes, actually, so neurology, psychiatry, um, rife with examples of cases of brain damage that significantly alter a personality. That, uh, many of you might have heard of this famous case of a railroad worker named Phineas Gage who was working and uh, was, had a tamping iron and you know, put it into a rock and it exploded through his, his frontal lobe and went all the way out the other side of his brain. And this was back in the 1800s. And everyone said, well, Phineas was a great guy. He would always come to work on time, an upstanding citizen. And then after this accident that sort of severed right through his frontal lobes, he became, uh, he didn't show up for work. He was doing uh, unsavory activities in his off time. And, you know, he, he changed. He became a different person. So there, there's clearly, you know, the, the brain basis of our personality and behavior. Um, if you've seen individuals with frontotemporal dementia, they often show a lot of inappropriate behaviors as well, that they might have um, you know, changed their personality as a result of this brain degeneration. So yeah, yeah, I definitely didn't mean to imply that you know changing the brain doesn't change who you are. But what's interesting is that the mapping is, is not completely worked out at this stage in, in neuroscience and medicine. So, um, and not every individual uh, shows the same consequences of the same exact a disease. So someone with frontotemporal dementia might um, might not exhibit any unusual behaviors, but another individual might be completely uninhibited and start swearing. So there's a lot of room for individual differences there. There's a lot of um, you know uh, genetic susceptibilities that alter how certain injuries might affect the outcome. So um, so it's. It's very curious, like you, you know, if you look in the medical history or even in recent work, there's a lot of curiosities, like these case studies of this happened to this person and they changed. But at the same time, you never hear of the ones of, well, this horrible injury happened to this person and they didn't change a bit. So, <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's quite a, a complicated picture. Uh, just to follow up on that, I, th I, I think part of the question may be, and I vaguely remember there being a, um, some brain states like this, are, are there cases where people seem to be able to be functional in some meaningful functional ways, but, the con but consciousness is not active in a way that we would, so, so that, um, uh, I, I, this is a long time ago, but I vaguely remember a form of epilepsy that at times could lead people to have sort of long periods where they could still functionally drive a car, but they were actually not conscious and, and I don't, so I don't know if this is right or not, but I think this is what the, the question is pointing out. Are there kinds of surgery that may affect the consciousness itself without necessarily having taken away the other forms of functioning as a human being that we would identify? And that may not be possible. I don't, I don't know. I mean, consciousness I know is obviously critical to us being able to function. So I think that may be where the question is. Sounds like a, a zombie or... <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I suppose that would be sort of what it was, right? Yeah, no, um, yeah, I think in the, the levels of, of consciousness, um, I mean, it's not that it's so easy, but it's easier to say, well, this person is completely in a vegetative state or they're in a minimally conscious state or they're in a coma and there are certain measures that um, the doctor will take to say, okay, you're... You know, if your your pupils aren't dilating, for example, you're in this stage. Uh, you're not responding to sound. You're in this stage. You're, there's there's various sort of benchmarks to um, assess levels of consciousness, and this is what happens if you are in a hospital. They'll say, okay, you're in this state, that state, and the other. Um, and sometimes it's um, there. I mean, you can imagine all kinds of dissociated scenarios, like you're sleepwalking. You're you're uh, walking around even though you're you know. You're dreaming, Some, you're acting out your dreams. That would happen in a case where normally your muscles would be inhibited during sleep because that's, that's sort of the process of what sleep entails. But if your muscles don't get inhibited, sometimes you can act out. And 
So it's a state where you might look like you're acting like a conscious agent, but really you're, you're, you know, you're in your own head. You're, <laughs> the visions that you're acting out are, are, are dreams. So there are, there are really interesting levels of dissociation and, and behavioral distinctions that we can see. But, uh, you know, a lot of these have a perfectly logical explanation from a neurological standpoint, but there are some that are trickier. And the, the ones I brought up are, you know, if you have half of your brain removed, why is it that you're still conscious? I think that's a tricky question. We don't know. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, actually, uh, that hits right on what's happening right now uh, was for Dr. Bruce, um, the Dr. Bruce who presented on gene editing, not on the Dr. Bruce who said, I don't know what gene editing is. Um, so the question had to do with the coronavirus and saying, so we have this mutation in this virus, now we've suddenly got uh, people getting sick, and is there the possibility that something like CRISPR, would that actually be of use in, I suppose, prevention maybe at, at the level of um, uh, helping to stop the virus or changing people's, is, it a, is there a new kind of uh, treatment that we could do where more directly through CRISPR, uh, like the cancer treatment, is, is this the kind of thing that could work on something like that? is the question. I actually don't quite know. I mean, I know vaccines definitely are very effective ways to halt the progression of a virus. That just takes time to develop. So I, I would assume that uh, there are various countries that are working on vaccines right now very quickly to try and get uh, um, just the possible preventative measures in place. Um, and I would assume the in China, they're definitely working on this as, as well. How I would incorporate CRISPR genome editing into that, um, I'm not exactly sure if I can think of a way in which it would be used, but I, I can toss it no to my other. I suspect no is an acceptable answer, too. So, I mean, I think that is, you know, no could be the answer, that this would not really help with that. It would be more genetic issues that it would help with. That's where I would go with first. I, I could toss it to the other scientists and see if they have any uh, uh, ideas as to how that would be used. I can't think of any off the top of my head. So, uh, one of the questions, this is an interesting one, it probably, I'm going to give you all permission to say I don't want to answer that. Um, so this one has to do with the environmental issues. And the question was, given that there are env environmental issues, given that there are, that there, that is true that hum humanity can affect the environment positively and negatively by its activity, and that the more of us there are, the more easily we can significantly affect the environment. The question was whether it's better for the mitigation to be done through government regulation versus market activity. <laughs> Free market or government regulation to address mm -hmm. the ethical, the consequences of environmental issues. <laughs> yeah. You got, actually, you, got, you, yep. you got one right there. Well, I'm not an environmental scientist I'm and I'm not an ethicist, but I am going to give this one a shot. Um, Let's, take, let's transplant ourselves back 120 years or so in the United States. And at that time, the avail of a, uh, food supplies and water supplies and milk supplies were essentially unregulated. And, and there were bad guys in the game who, who didn't care about what people were getting on the, on the, on the, on the consumer end. And, and, and putting, putting stuff that's not good for you in milk to make it cheaper to sell, and, and likewise with other things people were eating. So the FDA basically gets created and comes along and starts regulating this. And I think that's good, and I think probably all of us would think that's good that government came in and prevented bad guys from making profits by literally killing people. And, and so, because there, as, as a reformed person from my own background, Calvin talked about total depravity, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in this. We're all capable of doing wicked things. And when bad people do wicked things like that, and it harms all of us, sometimes it takes the big boys, the government, to come in and shut that down. And, you know, it does exist to wield the sword against the evildoer. And so the question is, do, as I see it, is are some of the things that we do to the environment that we still might not even, most, many of us might be ignorant of even, 
are harmful. Are some things really objectively harmful? And, 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 and ultimately kill creatures God has made or kill ourselves, do we need the big boys to come in and stop the bad guys? That's the analogy I would offer. So I would say in, in principle, no, I don't think free market necessarily solves it. It might in many cases. In many cases it might. But in all cases, probably not. So sometimes we might need the government to come in and stop bad guys. So let me... Um yeah, we're actually almost out of time. I'm going to add something in because of the reformed issue, and we've got one person who I'm, I'm guaranteeing is going to be on the spot, so I need to get him next. So um, one thing for our reformed audience that's really interesting it, that seems to have gotten lost in a lot of the current discussion about politics, the reformed understanding of government itself arises out of the notion of the family. And if you were to go look in traditional Reformed theological ethics, they will be <clears throat> under the commandment about honoring your father and mother will be the language of how to do government. And the way government is predominantly understood is as an extension of family. That is the, that is the theological construction under which that is done. And so sometimes we can ask this question about government in a way that would actually be helped by the question of what would we expect a parent to do of its children? Um, and that is part of the understanding of what government would do. And so th with that framework, it can be actually a little bit easier than when we treat the free market and the government as if they're separate forces. So it's just something to think about in terms of the way the reform tradition has done that. Now, let me, we're there on time. So if you, how quickly can you go? I'll go fast. All right, go fast. Uh, you know, but I think also the uh, free market will help bail us out, um, especially when we think about energy and energy innovation. Uh, the rest of the world is investing in, in renewables, and that, that's basically going to be the technology of the future. Um, in this country, we are doubling down on, on old technologies, but I think the free market is going to drive it, and the price of renewables are going down because of that. So um, I think the free market is going to play a role. It may not benefit us in this country in this phase, but um, it, it will help us with our energy innovation because we are going to have to power the future. Yeah. Okay, so last question that I just sent in to myself um, for Dr. Bruce. Uh, when, when you talked about the response to the gene editing and you tossed back some really important questions on gene editing in the future, I think, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of people in the audience that are thinking through, but I, I don't really know the gene editing very well either. I heard a bunch of letters and I'm not really sure how to compare uh, zinc and CRISPR in terms of what it does, except that one's more expensive. But now what do I do when a real person walks in that really does well in the garden? So the jellyfish one, if you haven't seen it, that jellyfish DNA has been done to some fairly high-level mammals. Is there any technical reason that somebody could not make themselves glow in the dark right now with that same process that you know of? The guy who's trying the dogs has not yet succeeded. He so hasn't succeeded it is, with it dogs. is a lot tougher than just, you know, so getting frogs, like that. is that as high? I've, I've seen the glow in the dark frogs, but I thought. Pretty sure I've seen mice. Mice? Yeah. Okay, so we have glow in the dark mice. Pigs? So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think transgenic pig pigs. Uh -huh. And pigs? Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know what? I've got the little yellow snout. I don't even have to turn the lights on to see my bacon now. This is a better world. That is a better world. <laughs> what, what do you do when somebody comes in and they have, they have genetically modified themselves? Like, what is the first reaction that you'll have to them pastorally? And where do you go? What do you do? Because people are trying to do it to themselves. And we don't have good resources on that. Escape from having to answer any questions. So you're really putting me on the spot. I my, thought you um, weren't. My initial reaction would just be hope that you're married to a Christian scientist. <laughs> and you can ask her. <laughs> um, <laughs> Failing that, um, show some cognitive modesty. Don't act like you know if you don't. And this is kind of echoing something that Tim said to us earlier. If you don't know the answer, don't pretend. Um, if somebody comes to you and is asking you for advice about their glowing child, you know, don't, don't act like you know that. If they still want an answer, um, I would look for good resources. And I think that includes scientists who are devout, who actually care about taking scripture seriously, who care about people being created in the image of God, um, but who have actually looked at the issue more than you have. 
And I think that's the beauty of church settings where scientists feel like they're being included and involved in what's going on is you will have those resources, hopefully, as a pastor. Or maybe you'll know someone who does. So that, that would be my, my answer. If you can't be married to a scientist, hopefully you know one. All right, very good. So we are at the place on time. Did you want to add, add something in one more time there? Or was I was it? just curious. I mean, what would be the difference with someone coming in between genetic enhancement versus someone with chemical enhancement, taking smart drugs, or mechanical enhancement, say, with cosmetic surgery? I mean, why, why, why draw the line of genetic enhancement? I, I think the interesting part that will get played out, this is my guess theologically on that, is that the way we understand, particularly now, um, those traditions that treat the descent from Adam as being a very significant part of being human and being in Adam and original sin, I think that there's going to be questions of how much can we change our DNA from what we got from him and still be human in the in him sense of being human. So it'll be similar to the discussion that's going on right now about what, what does have to, be, have to be true about origins compared to just the evidence of the genetic diversity that we have in the room right now and some of the questions about how that came about. But I think it will have a special form that will be a little bit different than the mere chemical question because of the, because of the importance of that concept of descent um, in the understanding, and, and I would say particularly in the reform tradition, I think it'll play a big role because of the understanding of the importance of descent in terms of both the being in Adam and the being in Christ. Even though that latter one is by adoption and adoption plays a stronger role, I, I suspect we'll start doing more adoption language later in theology, but this is where I'm now speculating about what will happen in terms of some of the replies. Can I just say quickly, I had a 15-year-old student in the audience today who asked um, if the twins who were genetically modified were still created in the image of God and how you would tell that. Yeah. I was so, the so excited he's asking that question. Right. The question comes up right then when, when this wasn't really um, so much when I was dealing with ethical student, or ethics, ethical students sometimes, but always <laughs> ethics in the classroom. Um, one of the questions was if we genetically modify rice, right, golden rice. If, if all of the rice got cross-pollinated with golden rice that was directly by human intervention, has rice gone extinct, right? Is rice extinct if there's nothing left that didn't get changed by human beings? And it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's meant to be a thought-provoking question, but it's very significant when you start thinking about being uh, the image of God and salvation. So I think that's where it's going to come in. So let me, uh, if we can all thank them one more time. Uh, we're... I'll, I'll let you guys, I mean, you're welcome to sit behind me, but I don't know. I'm going to give a couple of concluding remarks. If you see on there, I understand how uh, tired everyone is. It's not going to be long, but I want to give you some concluding thoughts. I have one exact quote that I'm not going to quote exactly because of the lack of podium, which is quite fine. It's not worth the purposes. If you want to go, um, at, when I talk about it, if you want to go to the reference, if you go to Calvin's commentary on Titus, verse 13, you'll find the reference that I'm talking about here. It actually hits on a couple of themes uh, that we've got. So as we, as we think through this, the, the certainty is, the certainty is, that unexpected questions will come up for us out of science. Regardless of your position, if you go back to the very beginning and all of these different views of how they ought to be interacted with or what we ought to do with them or whether it's just because scientists are trying to ruin religion, which hopefully you will see is not the case based even on the scientists that you've met today. But weird issues will come up. And I'd like to leave you with three thoughts under the framework of the idea, have no fear. Have no fear. The, the, the three thoughts relate, first, to the community of people who are alive right now. The, the second will relate to the community of people who have been alive in and out of the church throughout history. And the last piece of this will relate to God himself. So let me first say this. When something new and surprising and challenging comes up, we will not immediately have good answers almost ever. 
Not only will we not have good answers almost ever, but if you stick six people in a room with a question they are unprepped for, that they've never thought of before, and that doesn't strike them as something they were expecting, you're quite likely to get at least five, if not six, completely different answers. The community, as it gets a question for the first time, is not going to be united. Something else about it is, in that probably at least five and maybe six answers, none of those will probably end up being the best answer that even those six people could come up with. There's interesting research on something that goes by the name of brainstorming. You've probably heard of it. And brainstorming is the idea that we just get together and there's no such thing as bad questions, there's no bad ideas, we throw them all up on the board, and that somehow we've made progress. The interesting research shows that you almost get nothing good out of that ever. That one of the best ways to have a bad result is to tell everybody that all of their ideas are good. They're not, and neither is yours. But that there are companies that are remarkably good at ending up with good ideas, and the way they do it is by saying, say what you think we should do, and then arguing vehemently against each other. Now that can be done angrily or that can be done friendly, friendlyly, that can be done with a good environment of we're trying to go together to the right place and bad ideas won't help us. Or it can become angry and pejorative and defensive. One of the ways in which these discussions about science don't work well in the church is when we draw the wrong umbrellas open the wrong umbrellas, declare the wrong fence lines, however the analogy will work best for you on who's in and who's out. You see, when we first get confronted with a new question, some of the answers we give, even if we're trying to do it all the way right, are going to be wrong. The question whether it's a Reformed circle, or a Christian circle, or an evangelical circle, the question is not, did you get the answer right the very first time? But actually, a lot of it just has to do with how are you trying to answer the question. And so I want to give one example so I can move on, because I promised you I'd be fast. Evangelicalism, using that as opposed to Christian or Reformed, which are different circles, evangelicalism, when it tries to define itself around infallibility, says... Scripture is inerrant and infallible with respect to all that it affirms. It says more than that, but that's the main language. Now, if a scientific issue comes up and it makes somebody say, maybe Scripture isn't affirming that. So if you remember the example at the beginning, Jupiter is smaller than the moon. Oh, Jupiter is bigger than the moon. I thought Scripture was affirming Jupiter is smaller than the moon. Maybe it isn't affirming that. Now, regardless of which way you end up on the answer to that question, and we've all, I think, in this room landed in the same place, if the person is saying, maybe it isn't affirming that, then they are seeking to answer the question as an evangelical Christian. If they're in error then they're in error. But they're in error on the inside. Now, if instead they said, the Scripture does affirm that Saturn is smaller than the moon, so Scripture is stupid and wrong, or just wrong, then they're answering from the outside. We need to make use of the resources that are our resources because we are, when we do it well, smarter together. We are not immediately smarter together. We are not always smarter together. And we're definitely not smarter together when we're defensive or brainstorming. But we can be when we have a process of working together to answer hard questions from within the idea of saying, I thought it affirmed that, but maybe it didn't. So in terms of the community today, that's a resource. I don't have to have all of the answers participate in the conversations, and I want to expect that my first answer will probably not be my best answer, and even my best answer may be completely wrong. 
And if it's about the church and not me, that's okay. The second resource, though, is the historical resource. This is what's so interesting to me. When I found that language in Calvin about this argument about Saturn, that helped me. That is the fight about Genesis and science. That is such a big, critical, controversial fight right now. Calvin, having already worked through one, and me being able to bring out an example in the Reformed tradition, and being able to blame Calvin, which I like because I learned it from him. Because if you read Calvin, he very often says, don't argue with me, argue with God, he said it. And here I can say, don't argue with me, argue with Calvin, he said it. But he said it because he thought Scripture said it too. But Calvin is the one saying, clearly God has accommodated his language. Clearly he has. Calvin is saying that. He says clearly he's accommodated his language because there are places where God uses accommodated language. In fact, Calvin uses the language of lisping. God lisps to us because we are not capable of understanding that even when he is speaking all the way propositionally to us, our limitations are such that we cannot fully comprehend the glory of God. And so God lisps in Scripture. He lisps and he accommodates Because, as we heard in that, I think it is true that if Moses, to the people coming out of Egypt, had said, well, actually, Saturn's really bigger than the moon, it just doesn't look that way, that wouldn't have been helpful to them in terms of what he was trying to communicate. And frankly, they might have said, Moses, you're crazy. I knew you were crazy. They already said he was crazy. And now he's trying to tell them that Saturn's really big and far away. And by the way, you're moving really fast and spinning and rotating. That wasn't the purpose. Now, again, this is not me. This is the tradition of hermeneutics in the church that is long-standing and runs through Reformed theology and Augustinian theology to the very beginnings of the church in understanding what otherwise might seem to be impossible scriptures to interpret. The problem that people have is the real problem of it can lead to me saying Scripture doesn't affirm just about anything. And slippery slopes are what they are. A signifier that we need to be careful, but not an argument. What I mean by that is, when we see a slippery slope, well, if you use that accommodation, you could get out of anything then that means that we need to be careful that the way we're doing it is in the way that is right and appropriate. And again, one of the best ways to learn that is to see the people whose work in that very area led us to the good places that we are now theologically in orthodoxy. They, again, those who went before us, are our resources to be models of how to avoid the slippery slope. It's important to see it because it's a warning to us, but it's not ever an argument against the whole truth. It is on the list of fallacies that you'll find in logic. And here's the last idea, and this is the ultimate idea, the most important idea, the one that grabs it all together, and it's also an old idea. And it's also there in Titus. In Titus, Calvin says, essentially, All truth is God's truth. Truth does not conflict with truth. He says, even if you find truth in people who are otherwise sinful and outside of the church, that's okay. Because if it is true, it comes from the author of truth, and that is God. And the ultimate reason that we don't need to have fear is because whether the conflicts last for just a little while or last for a long time or seem as if they're resolved and then get unresolved, like this one on the age of the earth that we heard about, whether they linger for hundreds of years or are over in a flash, in the end, if we are rightly interpreting what God has affirmed through his word, and if we are rightly interpreting the truth revealed in his world, then the truth will not conflict with the truth because it all belongs to God. And that's ultimately like why we don't need to have fear. Because these will not be in conflict. 
in the umbrella of, evangel of evangelicalism, in the umbrella of Reformed theology, in the umbrella of Nicaea and being a Christian, there will be people who say things that are wrong. And over time, with loving argument, hopefully that error will be repaired. Hopefully, humanly speaking, and in God's providential work, definitely. The error that needs to be repaired will be repaired and eventually will die and know the truth. For sure. But you know what? A lot of our argument is wasted time because these things have already been answered. And so one of the things we should do is not only be ready to lovingly argue now about hard topics, but go back and find out this has all been done before. And it almost always has. It hasn't always, always been done before, but it almost always has. It's remarkable. It was so disappointing doing my PhD to find I had almost nothing new to say, even though I was working with quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity and God and time and uncertainty, it was all long done. I just had new words to put on it. Contingency, random events, God's sovereignty, eternity, the unity of all things before him. If it hadn't been done by Augustine, it was done by Boethius, and most of them were repeating things that they had learned from people that died 700 years before. Lots of it's already there, and that can be a help. But even when there's no help, even when the conversation goes bad, even when we're struggling to do it well, even when we can't find the right resources, even when we don't know the place to go, we can still be confident that it is finally all God's truth. And we may die not knowing. We just may not be smart enough to get it. It may take other people who don't come along until we're all gone to sort it out and who got it right and who got it wrong. And that'll be okay. Because Christianity is a, a religion of truth. It says there is truth, and God is the source of that truth. And whether he has revealed it in his world or whether he's revealed it in Scripture, Christianity is a religion that says it is true, and all truth is God's. It belongs to him. He's the start of it. He's the end of it. He's the purpose of us understanding it, and it will be okay no matter how much it drives us crazy. So that, hopefully, allows us the space to be patient. It just might take a while to figure these things out. And that's all right. It's all right with God. It has been in history. Go back and look. So it's all right now. And it ought to be all right with us. Um, let me pray. I thank you all for your time, for being here. I appreciate uh, this is a lot on a Saturday. And so it's great. I appreciate all the speakers, all the presenters for all that they've done, all the people in the back who've made things work. Um, a lot of people, a lot of work to make this happen. Those of you that, that joined in remotely, thank you for your time as well. Uh, let's pray. Father, I pray that through work like this and that through this seminary, you would do, you would do the work that we have been called to which is to train up the men and women that you're calling into your service, to help them to be able to think well, to help them to be able to serve well, that they can be people who carry the gospel out, speak clearly and speak truth, and declare the good news that you came, that you took on true human flesh, that you really lived, that you really died, that you really were resurrected, that you really are the hope for us having resurrection, that you made this world that you created all of the regularities and rationality to it, that you made us in your image, that we could see you in the world and in our brokenness when we walked away in your word that you gave to us. Lord, that we would be people of faith and truth, who bring that good news to those who don't know you, and disciple each other who do know you, that we can be made more and more into your image every day in hope of our resurrection and perfection to come. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much. It was really great to have you for such a long day. Thank you.